All right, let's get going. So uh, first off, uh, I'd like to congratulate the uh, 11 teams who made it onto the leaderboard. Um, and I want to use this, uh, this particular, these, this, the, the leaderboard for TPCH3 and TPCH1 uh, to illustrate a point. Um, so there is a huge span of uh, results for TPCH3. In fact, uh, the, there's about two orders of magnitude difference in the performance across uh, the top 11 teams uh, in the class for TPCH3, while by comparison for TPCH1, and in fact all of the other queries, uh, that difference is far, far smaller. Um, would anyone care to venture a guess for why that is? Joins, yes. So uh, at one end of the TPCH3, of all of the queries, TPCH3 was the only one that included more than one relation, or joined between more than one relation. Um, and that kind of massive speed up, um, two orders of magnitude difference, is, comes about by executing the joins uh, effectively. And that's basically what we're going to talk about today. So we started off with nested loop joins. And well, those were kind of slow, not necessarily super effective. They're n squared in the amount of data that we have. And what we're going to focus on today uh, is, well, we're going to talk about a couple of different things, but one of the, the main thing I want you guys to get away from, uh, to get uh, from today's lecture is uh, a variety of different strategies for executing joins that are, uh, that can be quite a bit more efficient than nested loop join. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to briefly kind of finish up on indexes with, by defining a term uh, called an access path. And before I define that term, let's just do a quick uh, example to make sure you guys are, uh, are awake and to kind of motivate some of the, the, uh, the work that we're going to be talking about today. So I've got this nice little query here. Um, how, what is, uh, get some space on the board. Um, what is the relational algebra expression for this query? All right. Start me off. Hmm? S cross R. Okay. So start off with S and R. And I would start by translating the from clause into uh, S cross R. Okay. What's, what's next? Selection. So I've got this big selection. On top of that, uh, I'm just going to call that term one, term two, and term, uh, term one through four, T1 and T2 and T3 and T4. All right. And then hmm? aggregate. So we build an aggregate on top of that. And yep, that's it. All right, how would we go about optimizing this expression? OK, so there are some terms in there that only apply to one particular term, to one particular expression. Can you give me an example? Uh, s dot a, e uh, sorry, s name equals Alice. Okay, so I'll push uh, term one down through the cross product, giving me select term one of s sitting over a cross product of, and we may as well do both push downs in one step. What else am I? R dot grade, R dot grade. So select term two and, ter uh, sorry, term three and term four going down to uh, relation R. 
I've still got my original selection here of term two, because I wasn't able to push that down. Uh, and I've still got my aggregate, because that cha doesn't change at all. Because I was only optimizing the, uh, the, join exp or the cross product expression. All right, what else? Can I do anything else? Yeah? All right, so cross product into a join. Um, and what is my join condition? All right, so that's term two sitting over select, select, S, R, just as before. Um, so in this case, doing an additional projection probably wouldn't help too much. Um, the one case where it would help especially in your projects, is if you can push that selection all the way down to the base terms. Um, the reason I say this, so projection has to be applied to every single row. So if you add another term um, that essentially takes one tuple and constructs an entirely different tuple out of it, that's typically going to be less efficient. Um, the best place to push down a projection is when you're constructing new tuples. So if you can figure out that um, I'm loading rows of S in, but I only need the first and third attributes, I can skip the second, fourth, and fifth attributes, then I don't need to parse those attributes in. Um, and parsing, while it's not necessarily super, uh, super slow, I mean, parsing an integer is, is quite fast, uh, it's something you need to do on every single row of the data, and so that could potentially slow you down quite a bit. Doing that one minor optimization helps. Yeah? Uh, the comment is, uh, parsing of date is very expensive. And yeah, uh, why do you think that is? Right, so first off, you have to take, uh, you have to essentially run a regular expression on it. Um, regular expressions are designed to be super, super fast, but you still have to run the regular expression. And one additional drawback is that the way Java is set up, that regular expression gets, uh, if you're calling split, the regular, exp or which I think the date constructor does, uh, the regular expression ends up getting compiled repeatedly. Uh, and compiling a regular expression is, is quite slow. So basically, any kind of structured data extraction is fast, but not so fast that you can't uh, benefit significantly by getting rid of it when it gets called a million times for a million rows. So pushing projections down to, uh, this is particularly uh, applicable for you guys because uh, you're reading from CSV files, from text files. So this parsing is there. So pushing projections down into your, uh, into your, your uh, relation operators can be quite effective. And that actually gets me to, um, to another question, which is how do I make these data accesses more efficient? So what can I do? Like if I had all the time in the world to prepare, if I knew that this query was coming, uh, I had to be able to respond to this query very, very quickly. But if I had all the time in the world to prepare for this query, um, what could I do? Yeah? Okay, so I could build some indexes. I could organize the data. I could build an index on S. I could uh, build a, a clustered storage layout for S. I could do, uh, so how, how would I do this organization? How would I organize S and R? For this specific query, at least. Uh, could you, sorry, I, I didn't hear that. Could you speak up? 
Oh, uh, index uh, index the the which attribute name s dot name. So index uh, or org sort s dot name. Or, excuse me. Sort s by the attribute name alphabetically. Great. Uh, what else can I do? I could also index grade column of R. Anything else I could potentially do? Yeah. Sort on uh, which? Uh, excuse me. So sort on grade and index the uh, sort the data on uh, sort R on grade and sort S on name. So you can s sort the two independently. Right. And it, what else can we do? Hmm? Okay, so I could do some grouping based on the grades. It's essentially, the something similar to sorting, uh, depending uh, what would the advantage. Uh, what would the trade-off be between grouping and sorting? Okay, so okay, so binning by since grade is an integer value, binning makes it uh, gives you constant time access to individual grade values. Okay, would that be appropriate for this query? So the, the short version is it, it, depend, it depends on whether or not it would be uh, a, on a number of things like how many grades there are in that range, 10. Um, in general, if you're trying to do range accesses like you are there, grades between 90 and 100, that uh, will typically be best served by a tree and or by some sort of sort or by having the records in sorted order because and this isn't universally true but sequential access is is frequently much better than random access uh, even if i'm talking about memory with sequential access you get uh, all of the data in the same place so you get uh, caching benefits In general, if you're doing uh, range accesses, you want the data sorted. Uh, if you're doing equality lookups, or find me the values for the specific key, then uh, you're already paying the random access cost, so uh, grouping becomes much better. So I might group students based on name, or based on some prefix of their name, like AL, every student whose name starts with AL. Okay. Um, so there's one more potential thing that I could do that I could index on here that might be potentially useful. ID. I'll let you guys think about that because we will get back to it in a few uh, in a few slides. Okay. I'll bring this back up. All right. So I promised I'd define this term access path. Before I do that, I just want to remind people of uh, the two terms that we talked about. Uh, I, brought up, I brought these terms up uh, last lecture, but just to reemphasize it, a clustered index is, uh, or a clustered uh, data organization, uh, has the data organized based on whatever um, strategy I'm using, uh, whether the data is sorted or, or what have you, or grouped. And an unclustered index or a secondary index essentially has a bunch of pointers. Um, also want to differentiate. Th so this essentially establishes uh, differentiation between the, uh, the kind of indexing strategy and the data organization strategy. Uh, so an ISAM or, or a B tree or any other kind of tree or hash based index is basically going to be a way of telling you where the data is located and then you can also coordinate the way th this kind of pointer structure with an actual, uh, the actual organization of the physical data. Um, so if my data is laid out sequentially on disk in the same uh, order that my index 
pointers are arranged, then I can uh, take advantage of things like sequential access. OK, high level bit. So this is going to kind of lead into some of the, the things we're going to talk about today. Um, the I'm going to propose a new type of operator. So right now we've been talking about just uh, we, uh, we've been talking about relations as essentially uh, file scan operators. So a relation you open it up and uh, read from it, and that essentially translates into a scan over the data. But in addition, you might potentially have many different indexes built up over your data. And using an index, or an index scan, essentially, uh, you can think of this as a, an operator that is equivalent to a selection sitting on top of a relation operator, but it gets implemented by accessing an index rather than by accessing uh, just the CSV file or however your, your data is, is stored on disk. Um, and the point I'm trying to make here is that there, uh, there are potentially many different ways of accessing a particular data value. And this is going to come up repeatedly as we continue talking about optimization. Um, in order to access some subset of the data, uh, the, the student records between the uh, with grades between 90 and 100, for example, um, I can access that data in a variety of different ways. And I can define, uh, well, essentially, the, the term access path refers to the specific uh, physical layout that you go to, the f specific physical representation of the data that you go to in order to access that specific piece of data. OK, how does this come into the picture here? Well, um, for simple pipelined operators like project and select, the access path is fairly clear. Where the access path starts diverging is when we start talking about binary operators like joins. And there are two general classes of joins, uh, equality joins and inequality joins. Uh, in other words, where you're joining on uh, one key to one key value or where you're joining from one key value to many key values. So what's just from a design standpoint, how, how do these differ? What are the, um, from the perspective of the output, let's say, uh, how, how are these two classes of joins different? Yeah? Number of tuples, Number of tuples produced. Um, could you expand on that? Okay, so for an equality join, we would typically expect to see outputs that are somewhere in the, uh, I the range of linear in the size of the inputs, whereas for an inequality join, we'd expect to see outputs that are quadratic in the size of the input root, uh, order n versus order n times m, where the two input tables are n and m. So in effect, Inequality joins, although they do represent a significant reduction in the amount of, of tuples that you get as an output, they're typically going to be uh, still in the same ballpark. So today we're going to focus mostly on equality joins. We'll talk, excuse me, we'll talk a little bit about uh, inequality joins as well, but uh, the place where we can really get a huge amount of benefit is from equality joins. 
Okay, so to recap, the basic join that we've been working with so far is this nested loop join where you start with tuples on the left hand side and then for every tuple on the left hand side you iterate over all of the tuples on the right hand side. Now this is horribly inefficient, especially if you're expecting to produce, uh, and um, this is quadratic, and if you're expecting to produce a number of outputs that's linear in the size of the input, well, this is, this is a horrible idea. And worse off, it means that you get horrible I.O. performance if you need to go to disk because, uh, because you're scanning through the entire B relation over and over and over and over and over. So one basic strategy that we've already talked about is this idea of a block nested loop where you partition the source data into a chunk uh, into a bunch of blocks and then you perform a nested loop join over each pairing of the blocks okay so skip and you perform a uh, nested loop join on each pair of blocks so The block nested loop join. Now, the reason I want to recap uh, nested loop join is that, in some sense, it kind of represents the basic strategy that we want to perform. So we have uh, we can scan over the tuples in one relation, and every time we get uh, a tuple on the left hand side, we want to figure out efficiently how to match it up with tuples on the right hand side. So how do we do that? What kind of, uh, what can we do to um, kind of very quickly identify which tuples on the right hand side are going to match up? And one strategy is to, so what happens if the data that we're getting is sorted on the attributes that we're trying to join on? So I'm trying to join student and, uh, and grade, and I have both student and grade sorted on the ID attribute. Again, an equi join. Hmm? Uh, what do you mean by login search time? Oh, uh, so if the data is sorted, then I visit every single tuple on the left-hand side and then do a login search over the right-hand side um, to find the right tuple. Okay, so that's... Uh, So that's a, uh, I, I bet you I can do it even faster than that. So if I am looking at student ID two, and then I happen to find uh, the, the, the grades for student ID two, where would, and then I move to student ID three, where would I expect to see the grades for student ID three? Right next to it. So instead of um, doing a search for every single uh, tuple, what I can do is just sit at the front of the list and give me one sec to ah, there we go. Uh, sit at the front of the list. All of my data is sorted. So um, if I have a pair at the front of my list, I produce an output. If uh, and then I just move my pointers forward and I keep moving the lowest pointer until um, I get to a pair. So in this case, uh, one and one produce an output, then I advance both pointers. Two and four don't produce an output. Two is the lower of those two, so I'll advance the pointer two to three. Three and four still don't produce an output, advance. Uh, five and four uh, don't produce an output, but now four is the lowest pointer, so I'm going to advance that. Does this remind anyone of anything? Merge sort. This is exactly merge sort. You're taking two lists, you're merging them together in order, and this is typically referred to as sort merge join, as opposed to merge sort. So you keep doing that, and eventually one pointer falls off the end of the list, and you're done. Okay. All right, so that's great if the data is already sorted. And in fact, um, what, MySQL did for a very, very long time, I don't know if they're still doing it, but as of about five years ago, 
MySQL was basically doing um, only sort merge join. Every single time it needed to do a join, it would sort one side of the relation, it would sort the other side of the relation, and then piped those two together. Why is that? Because it's super easy. If you implement a sort operator, um, impl all you need to worry, well, actually, skipping ahead of myself here. What is the working set size of sort merge? Skip back. Hmm? One or two. I mean, it's constant. Um, I never need to keep more than the head of my buffer in memory at any given time. So this is already super efficient from a memory standpoint. I'm going to need to implement sort anyway, and sort is something that I need to be aware of in, uh, with, with the amount of memory it takes up. So if I want to just implement something really simple that, uh, that performs well and still uh, has the ability to handle an arbitrarily large amount of data, well, this is it. So like I said, uh, MySQL, basically this was the only way that it handled sort merge, jo uh, that it handled joins. But okay, so there's a couple of other strategies you can take. And one of those other strategies uh, is to partition the data. So there's an algorithm called a hash join, and I'm going to be a little bit uh, clear about this. There are two algorithms that are typically referred to as hash joins. And so just to be clear, this is the external hash join, um, which you'll often here is uh, grace or hybrid hash join is the other type. I'll get into that in a moment. But an external hash join is basically designed to handle um, an arbitrary amount of data. So if I have these two data sets and they're big enough that they don't fit in memory at any given point in time, uh, one trick that I could potentially play is to partition both sets of data. So I start off with my two sets of records. I'll, parti oh, oops. I'll partition my left-hand side using some sort of hash function. We talked about those last lecture. And then I'll do exactly the same thing with B. In, eff in effect, I'm building two, index two hash indexes over my data, or two clustered hash indexes over my data. Now that I have them, all of my records partitioned, I'll start running whatever jo local join algorithm I want to run over every, single, um, over every single bucket. So, well, I have two ones in the first bucket, I have two fives in the second bucket, so both of those produce outputs. Now this is something you'll find very frequently in distributed systems, uh, because hash, func hash functions are very easy to compute and equality joins are quite frequent. Um, MapReduce, for example, uh, uses this as part of its uh, reduce step, typically. OK. So any questions up to this point? I should have been, yeah. Uh, I didn't understand uh, where this external hash, like hash table would be stored. Oh, on disk. So you, you create buffers for every hash, uh, for every hash bucket. Or you files, essentially. You create one file for every hash bucket. Um, or equivalently, you assign one hash bucket to every computer in a, in a distributed system. Does that address your question? Yes. So you go, the, the basic process is to go through every, every tuple in relation A, assign it to whichever bucket it belongs to, then create a, well, essentially create a separate file for all of the tuples in relation, or separate set of buckets for all of the tuples in relation B. Now you have one set of files for A, one set of files for B, find, and each of those files can uh, essentially pair up. So you have one bucket, uh, in this example you have six buckets, set of buckets for uh, tuples in A that hash to one, set of buckets in B that hash to one. You find, you pair those up, and then 
ideally, each bucket now fits in memory, so you can do something like a nested loop join on the elements of that bucket. Because you're never going to disk, there's no penalty for, uh, for I.O. Or you, you're only loading the data into memory once. Does that address your question? Yeah. So the question is, what is the typical hash bucket size, or how many hash buckets to create? Um, so there's the, this depends on how much data you have and how much memory you have. Uh, or, well, more directly, how many records you expect to fit in memory. Um, and there's a variety of schools of thought on this. Um, You would like, ideally, each hash bucket to construct. Uh, to you would ideally like each hash bucket to contain exactly enough data to fit in memory. That's obviously not going to necessarily happen uh, because there's uh, variability in how many or how the hash function works. Uh, you might have duplication in the data. Uh, typically, you probably want a number of hash buckets roughly equal to, I want to say the square root of your, the, the square root of however many uh, records, excuse me, the square root of the total number of records you can, you have divided by the total number of records that fit in memory. Um, let me double check. Can you post that question on Piazza, and I'll uh, I'll get to it. That uh, I I don't want to lie to you up front. Uh, off the top of my head, it would be something like the square, uh, just based on the birthday paradox. It would be something like number of records divided by number of records that fit in memory. Take the square root of that. Let me look into that. I'll get okay. So that doesn't answer your question, but um, any other questions? Yeah. Ah, uh, that is a great question. So what happens, uh, so the question is, what happened, uh, we're scanning through the data uh, twice, hypothetically, and that's going to take a while. Um, this whole query is going to take a very long time to process. So it's more than likely that someone, uh, depending on the workload that we're, we're looking at, someone's going to come along and insert something into A or insert something into B. Um, the, uh, so the answer, I'm sad to say, you will have to wait uh, about... No, we're actually getting close to there, about another third of the class through. But the short answer is locking. Uh, locking or some sort of consistency protocol. Um, just to give you a hint of, of what's coming, the basic idea is that uh, either you assume that the data is fixed and that the query result that you get is the query result at the time you issued the query, in which case doing an update during the query processing doesn't necessarily matter. Or you lock the table so that no one else can make changes. Um, there's a couple of more advanced gimmicks that you can play, but that's essentially the, the I mean, you could also see if anyone has made a modification to the, to the data uh, after you run the query, and if you realize that someone has, you rerun the query. Basically, there's a lot of tricks you can play, but it's, it's messy and is going to essentially occupy the second half of the course. OK? All right. So the last thing, uh, the last, or excuse me, there's two more uh, join algorithms we're going to talk about. Um, and the first of these is something called uh, the grace or uh, hybrid hash join. And this is essentially the same principle as a external hash join. But the difference is that here we keep the hash table in memory. And that buys us a few things. 
So first off, it means we only need to build half of the hash table. Why do I say that? So what I could potentially do here is build a hash table on A, sort all of the data or organize all of the data in A, in this case by grouping, and every time I visit a tuple in B, I find the appropriate hash bucket, do a nested loop join over that hash bucket, and then produce a result. So essentially I'm scanning over all of the tuples in B in order, in the order I receive them, and producing an output immediately. Now why can't I do this with an external hash join? Why couldn't I just scan over the tuples in B, find the appropriate hash bucket, grab all the tuples in that hash bucket, and complete my join? So what's the cost of looking up a hash bucket in each of these scenarios? Right, so here, all of my data is in memory. In the external hash join, all of my data is on disk. So if I want to do a random access into memory, well, you know, I'd, I'd like to do sequential access, but that's not necessarily, but I'd still get reasonable performance doing random access into memory. On the other hand, if all of my data is on disk, well, doing random access to a disk for every single tuple, that's going to be hella expensive. Um, so a hybrid hash or a grace, ha uh, grace hash join, um, I can essentially read, I only need to build the table for one of my data sources. I only need to have uh, enough memory to hold one of the two side, one of the two inputs, excuse me, in memory at any given time. So in this case, I only need enough memory to store all of A. B can be as big as I want because I only visit every tuple in it once. Okay, any questions on this? Yeah. Yeah, but we need to visit every tuple in B at least once anyway. So the question is, how do we store an entire hash table in memory? And the answer is, it depends. Um, this isn't, so the, the Grace hash algorithm doesn't work universally. Um, if I have two really, really big data sources, this, the performance of this is going to be atrocious because you're going to start paging to disk. However, If one of my uh, data structure, or if one of my inputs does fit in memory, um, and there's quite common, um, uh, there's actually, a, this is a, a quite common uh, feature. So uh, let me give you a quick example. Um, so let's say I have a uh, click stream data, uh, just one big set of uh, records where every row corresponds to one web page being uh, one line in a server log that says this web page was loaded by this client and i have for each of these clickstream entries a country and then i want to do some kind of selection based on let's say i want to get the uh, clicks from every country with at least uh, with a GDP of over $1 million. So give me all of the, the clicks that originate from a country with a GDP at least $1 million. Um, I could phrase that essentially as a, so country, uh, so this is really, really big. This is potentially also quite big but not necessarily huge. And especially if 
I select on some reasonably selective predicate. This now is going to be a relatively small table. Well, maybe not necessarily that small, but depending on how selective this predicate is, it'll be a small number. So now, if I want to run this query, I load this into memory, build my little table, and scan over this huge, potentially multi-petabyte file um, using the data in here. I guess the, the main takeaway is that this algorithm works really well if there is a huge disparity in the data sizes. You have one really, really big data set, and then uh, one much smaller data set. Does that address your question? Yeah. If both can fit in, the, uh, so this doesn't penalize you for uh, not being able to fit B into memory. Uh, it just it doesn't penalize you for for not being able to fit B into memory. Does that? If you can fit both into memory, this works just as well. Ev well, better obviously because you're not scanning, you're not loading B off of disk. Right. Any other questions? Yeah. So in external hash join, um, the way I presented it is using in-memory nested loop join. But if you uh, subbed in grace hash join or really any join algorithm in there, it works just as well. Or any in-memory join algorithm, it works just as well. Does that essentially mirror what you're? OK. All right, so the last algorithm. Um, so the way that grace ha or that grace hash join is uh, works, we're essentially building an index at query time. What if we already have an index? What if we've already built an index over one side of our relation? Why don't we just use that? And so the last algorithm we're going to talk about is index nested loop. So just like uh, grace hash join, this essentially works like a nested loop join, except the inner loop uses an index lookup rather than just iterating over all tuples in the, in the relation. So for my first tuple, I'm going to do an index lookup. For my second tuple, I'm going to do another index lookup. For my third tuple, keep doing index lookups as long as I have more tuples to read. OK, so we are. Coming to a close, um, let me finish with a couple of uh, questions or some high level thought questions. So, we've just discussed a bunch of different algorithms nested loop, block nested loop, uh, sort merge, hash, grace hash, and uh, index nested loop. So, now that we have a bunch of options, how do we pick between them? Uh, the amount of data you're working with. Yeah? OK, so one of the major features we're looking for is how much data we're working with, or the size of the, the different relations. OK. Any, yeah? OK, so there's a restriction on uh, certain algorithms based on the type of query. So you can't use a hash algorithm or hash-based join to uh, compute an inequality join. Whereas if I wanted to do, uh, let's say, a inequality join, I could use an index nested loop join. Um, OK. Any other properties? Hmm? Available memory. OK, so basically between uh, the size of the data, the um, available memory, the type of, proper, uh, the type of um, 
uh, of predicates that we can get. And also in the case of index nested loop join, do we actually have an index that works for the join? Um, well, I'll, uh, this, you don't actually need to write this down. This is in your textbook and it'll be posted uh, on the slide decks. But basically there's a huge amount of different uh, trade-offs between these. Um, and it's not always clear which one is best. Uh, just, I mean, there are weird corner cases, there are even weird, weird corner cases where nested loop beats out everything else. Um, typically when the size of the, uh, the output is relatively, or the size of the input is relatively small. So uh, with that, are there any final questions? All right, so uh, we will pick up on Friday with external sort, and that should be basically between that and sort merge join, that should be enough to implement most of project two, or a good chunk of project two, that, and that sort merge join and uh, re query rewriting. <laughs>